two years ago at our uh, ninth annual conference, we had a presentation by uh, Marty Seligman, who told us about experiments that he had done. One, uh, computing something he called the Losada ratio, which was the ratio of, of uh, positive words to negative words. And he, he found that if you put uh, couples in an apartment and monitored everything they said, and if their Losada ratio was below five to one, they were headed to divorce. And in companies, if you looked at their meetings, uh, if their Losada ratio was below three to one, that the company was, was headed towards bankruptcy. And um, I see that our favorite word at the center now appears to be decline. So I hope, uh, it seems to spell trouble ahead, but uh, there, there's some optimistic notes and maybe, maybe it's, it, it's, it's not so bad. Um, uh, Marty Seligman is the, uh, the Napoleon of data collection in positive psychology. But we're taking, uh, taking a, um, a uh, cue from him in today's session. We have two, uh, both uh, Raicho Bolichov and Daniel Klein have collected a kind of data to try to measure um, the frequency of various terms in long data sets using n-grams, which they'll tell you about from searching all the books in, uh, in Google to see the incidence of words. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a, a fascinating endeavor. Uh, but you know, it suffers from, in the, in the case of Seligman, you say, well, do people use positive words because they have a positive relationship, or is the relationship breaking down, and does that cause the positive words? The same issue of endogeneity is going to affect the engram. So I'm, uh, I see that uh, Daniel Klein found that the use of liberty has gone down dramatically since 1750. Is that because, after a peak around the time of the Revolutionary War, is that because we have so much liberty now we've lost interest in it and moved on to other things? Is it because uh, liberty is kind of a strong word these days and we're a cool culture? I tried the same engram with freedom and found that freedom was actually going up a bit uh, while liberty was, was, uh, was, was going down. Um, or is it just the, the uh, rise of cookbooks and other things or just less interest in that kind of thing. And then finally, uh, specification searching. It's so easy to, you know, I, I, uh, I wanted to show that uh, during the time of the crisis, people had lost their nerve because they were focused on extreme events. So I did a search for Black Swan. It didn't get me the right result. And I said, oh, it was confounded with a movie of the same name. So then I searched on fat tail distribution. Okay, aha, I had it. So. I, I put it in the paper and, and, and moved on. I did find, which was encouraging, that the term specification search on n-gram has been going up and up. So that's a, that, that is a, indeed a, a positive sign. But I, I guess, you know, our topic here, so I, I, I hope in the, uh, and I'm sure none of these points are new, and I hope in the in, uh, Wright Show and Daniel's presentation they'll, they'll talk about these issues. You know, our session is the measurement of cultural data, and there's just no, there can be no doubt that business culture in America has got is a strength of why we 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 adopted the internet, and in uh, Bob Gordon's chart, we overtook Europe in, in productivity growth in '96. It's got to be something that's cultural. You know, it's easy to to go from the. There's nothing more timid than getting a non-experimental, a natural experiment or some data set, than saying. What, what question can we ask from this data set? And you end up asking very small questions. Oh, we found that sumo wrestlers cheat. Okay, so what? It's a much more meritorious venture to say, what question do we want to ask, and then go about collecting the data. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's easy to, to uh, to poke at this effort, but I think it's a courageous thing to do to try to collect this data. You can collect it from looking at history with the eye of an economist, as Ned has done valiantly and to great effect, and now we're at the beginning of exploring all this vast data of, uh, of literature to see what, what has been on the minds and how have, have uh, cultural trends that impact economic life evolved over time. So I'm, uh, with that, I'm going to re return to the role of timekeeper and turn <laughs> things over, over to Ned. A 
the starting point of my book, Mass Flourishing, uh, is the mass prosperity, the, the high employment, and most extraordinary, the increasing availability of engaging careers that emerged in the 19th century, first in Britain and America around 1820, and then Germany and France around 1870, <clears throat> and continued almost uninterruptedly to the middle of the 20th century. Never before in history had such prosperity come to large and increasing numbers. Uh, yet, uh, these nations appear now to have lost much of this prosperity. In, in, in my judgment, as I look at the data and think about the data, Britain and Germany by the 1940s, France by the, let's say, the early 1960s, and America by the early 1970s. <clears throat> Only during the build-out of the internet did any of them recapture for a time uh, the prosperity of old. The setback is pronounced in America, Britain, and France, maybe less so uh, Germany. Uh, of course, the diffusion of previous innovations continued. The diffusion continued. The technology has still trended up, pulling up domestic income, gross domestic income, and wealth. This and the public sector may have raised the so-called quality of life, economic security, public safety, amenities like stadiums, and the leisure brought by a shorter work week. But this quality of life is no substitute for prospering. <clears throat> the prospering I refer to could only come from doing rewarding things. The material rewards were the gains in one's earning power and the widening of one's opportunities that came from expanding one's capabilities. The non-material rewards were the experiential gains from encountering new problems to solve, exercising initiative, imagining new things, and exploring the unknown. Also, the personal growth that results from this process. Among people starting with low wages and little wealth, material rewards count for a lot in choosing a job, for example. But as people climb the ladder, most of them become deeply interested in non-material kinds of rewards. <clears throat> this prospering, <clears throat> I hold, is of inestimable value. It relates to Aristotle's concept of the good life, the sort of life that people admire in others and, inspire, and aspire to for themselves. It is widely thought among philosophers and humanists that the good life is, in substance, a life of flourishing, accepting challenges, interior struggle, voyaging into the unknown, overcoming obstacles, living fearlessly, and becoming. <clears throat> um, obviously, the non-material prospering I have just described a moment ago is emblematic of this uh, flourishing. This flourishing is the right notion of the good life in, in the modern world. Slide one, um, <clears throat> I guess it's here, yes. Slide one uh, compares a quality life, a life uh, in which the, uh, the quality of life is pretty good, uh, <clears throat> with uh, the good life. <clears throat> and um, they're different batches of goods, really. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> parenthetically, I want to say that even material prospering has a place in the good life because it enables people 
to be able to afford uh, interesting, challenging jobs. Uh, <clears throat> this extraordinary prosperity that broke out in those countries and its subsequent decline have raised big questions for economics. What was going on in those nations? What were the sources of the flourishing? And what are the sources of the decline of prosperity in, in Britain and Germany, France, and finally America? <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit now about the perspective on those matters uh, in my book. First, what is going on? Uh, that, that brings up the notion of indigenous innovation. <clears throat> Although the early historians of the 19th century, uh, Walt Rostow and um, Kuczynski, missed it, I think it is clear what was going on. In Britain and America, there was a frenzy of efforts, large and small, to innovate. A massive outbreak of tinkering and dreaming. Abraham Lincoln said, and I owe this quote to Richard, Abraham Lincoln said, I don't know how he has time to read so much, uh, Abraham Lincoln said of America in his 1858 lecture that there was in the country a perfect rage for the new, a rage that was rife among consumers, he, he surely meant, and I suppose if he thought about it, producers too. Business people were constantly thinking of ways to improve methods of production or the product itself, and many were conceiving of new products to develop and to try out in the marketplace. <clears throat> <clears throat> Innovation on so massive a scale was unprecedented, even in Britain and America, let alone France and German lands. The highly traditional economies of the Middle Ages and even the period of mercantile capitalism were corporatist in many respects. They were oriented toward providing people with survival and some economic security, social protection of their vocations, protection from one another, concertation of the social partners in the interest of solidarity, and provisions for governing the activities of the economy. A lot of able people functioned at the interface between the rulers and the producers, rather than being on the ground in firms in which they might have been engaged in activities leading to innovation. Slide three. <clears throat> in my numbering. <laughs> in some ways, uh, this describes, uh, in some ways this describes the mercantile capitalism of, of the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, not just the feudal economies. The sporadic innovations that occurred in these, in these times, in those times, or those earlier times, were preponderantly exogenous to the economy. They were obvious, it was Schumpeter's word, obvious commercial applications by Schumpeterian entrepreneurs of discoveries made by scientists and navigators, as Arthur Spiethoff of the German Historical School uh, put it. What made indigenous innovation possible in the 19th century in these countries uh, was the emergence of a modern economy in place of traditional economies. That's my thesis, or that's one of my theses. It was, uh, the modern economy was high in dynamism. By dynamism, I mean the desire and capacity and scope to innovate. In America, this dynamism was strong even in the years of the Great Depression in the 1930s. Alexander, uh, what's his name? Uh, <clears throat> um, human resources, of initiative and imagination were being extensively devoted to innovative activity, not to war or uh, to politics. 
the high level of dynamism was evident right down to the grassroots of society. No wonder there was mass flourishing, as I called it. Employee engagement ran high, and jobs were more satisfying than the routine, isolated work of the rural economies. And no wonder that productivity growth was unprecedented. No economy before had drawn on the imagination and creativity of the bulk of the nation's minds. To possess the dynamism required to generate rapid indigenous innovation, the modern economies also needed entrepreneurship. Indigenous innovation requires entrepreneurs to judge what is workable and to carry out the development and marketing of a new method or product. So entrepreneurship involves not only hustle and a wide grasp, but also judgment and wisdom. But indigenous innovation requires innovators with insight, imaginativeness, and vision. Also the courage to stand apart from conventional thinking. So the idea that business can be depended upon to possess the dynamism for indigenous innovation is not really correct. The right sort of business people, the right stuff, call it innovatorship, is required. Ordinary people do possess the imagination and creativity to achieve originality if, 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 uh, and though they have to be motivated to, to get up and, and, and do it. And some of the people can be expected to have the insight to make good guesses about what creations would succeed and, and in the marketplace and what creations would not. So the resources are there, but something has to happen uh, to get it going. Uh, I should add that innovation also requires a social and political climate supportive of innovating, of the disruptions and the um, Joel's uh, tolerance of uh, heterodoxy. <clears throat> so how do, how do, what, what fueled the innovators? What sparked the innovators? Uh, this brings me to what I call modern values. Uh, the core of the book is the thesis about the sources of the rise and the origins, the sources of the rise and the sources of the decline, uh, not the dis disappearance, but the decline of the modern economy in America, also Britain, <coughs> Germany, and France. <coughs> the book argues at length that what made possible the eventual rise of dynamism in, the, in those nations in the 1800s was the emergence of what I call modern values. In these nations, sufficient, sufficiently many people were present who possessed the individualism, the vitalism, and uh, uh, the desire for self-expression that was necessary for innovative activity to be intense and widespread. Slide five, I think, Jeff, on my... Oh, you got it. Okay, good. <coughs> These individualist values include thinking for oneself, working for oneself, the right not to be dispossessed, dis dispossessed by the community or the state, the vitalist values include taking initiatives and undertaking to act on the world. The expressionist values include making a mark for yourself, imagining and creating, testing one's views against evidence. <coughs> an, uh, an innovator is often trying to show people that he understood the world better than you, you other people did. Uh, in contrast, several sorts of traditional values, traditional values operate to inhibit attempts at innovation or even to block attempts uh, or impede attempts 
uh, if, if, if they are, are, are made. The slow accretion of the uh, <clears throat> yeah, okay. Now, coming back to the modern values, the slow accretion of the modern values, the book suggests, finally achieved a critical mass sufficient to spark a desire to innovate and a willingness in, so in society to give some scope for innovation. <clears throat> Did something happen <clears throat> to, that, to uh, modern values <clears throat> that uh, inhibited, I'm sorry. What happened, to, did something happen to values that may have narrowed uh, the capacity or, or the scope for uh, innovation? Much of the book is a dogged pursuit uh, of the evidence in this regard. It finds no incontrovertible evidence of a decline of modern values. But a lengthy discussion in chapter 10 finds broad evidence of a resurgence of some traditional values since the 1960s. <clears throat> in the case of, uh, or in the case of European nations, even before. Slide, slide six. <clears throat> the last slide <clears throat> summarizes uh, my thesis. Um, modern values, if they're predominant, <clears throat> spark the engine of human imagination that drives innovation in the market uh, economy. And and this the and uh, the modern economy. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> makes possible the good life for uh, a large number of participants. Yet some traditional values, if they prevail over modern values, lead to a um, traditional economy um, of the corporatist uh, type, an economy that leaves uh, little capacity and scope for innovation. <clears throat> oh, thank you, sir. Okay. I was afraid it was Richard saying the time was up. <laughs> Doing okay here. Going as fast as I can. Um, <clears throat> What's wrong with the corporatist economy anyway? Well, it's not so bad. It permits a quality life. Amenities, those fast trains, the soccer stadiums, uh, the concert halls, lovely. But the good life is about doing things, doing rewarding things. And uh, the corporatist economy uh, is uh, lousy uh, in uh, providing the possibility of the good life. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> in the last section of, uh, I, I want to discuss uh, evidence of decline in innovation and in dynamism. Some of it's in the book and some of it's a little bit post-book. Uh, <clears throat> The book presents evidence of a decline of innovation in the American economy as a whole, always talking about aggregates here, and discusses signs pointing to a decline of dynamism, the desire, capacity, and scope to innovate. Some people in the general public are incredulous that anyone could think that innovation has declined. Since the personal computer and the internet have changed our lives, and they came after the early 1970s. However, the book is talking about the aggregate rate of innovation, and it suggests that dynamism has fallen off in established companies and does not spring so much from 
the grassroots anymore, with the result that innovation is concentrated now along the West Coast and led by elites from Harvard and Stanford and a, and a few other places. <clears throat> Yet some economists, such as uh, some at MIT, when I was writing this, I didn't have the name ready, and it's uh, one of those impossible names to remember. Uh, but some, some MIT economists deny that the aggregate rate of innovation is down. Curiously, American economists generally accept that there has been a fall off of innovation in Britain, Germany, and France. And some are ready to accept that European attitudes and beliefs have something to do with it. But when it comes to America, they seem to disagree. I will first discuss the argument and the evidence for the inference of a slowdown in aggregate innovation in the US economy. Then I will discuss some of the new evidence presented uh, that will be presented at this very session uh, on a shift of values. The aggregate rate of in indigenous innovation in America. The book supposes that the rate of indigenous innovation in the US economy is adequately measured by the rate of growth of total factor productivity, now known as multi-factor productivity. Obviously, we would not suppose that the rate of innovation in Iceland is well measured that way. We would understand that most of the productivity advances in Iceland, being quite a small country, are not indigenous to Iceland. <clears throat> they are so-called technology transfers, including firms' adoption of new products to produce. The book uses calculations uh, performed by Robert Gordon uh, to show that PFP growth declined by about a half in, 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 a, in a period from, oh, the late 1960s to about in, into, the, into, the in, into the 1970s a bit. 2.26% <clears throat> in 1922-72. One point oh four per cent seventy two to ninety six and zero point eighty one two thousand four to two thousand eleven. The exception is the years of the internet build out when it popped up, but even then it didn't get back to the old number. Now, the true drop in the rate of innovation is apt to be even steeper, since when innovating slowed, Nelson Phelps diffusion continued until every company had an IBM computer, figuratively speaking. It is possible that the data reflect not a decline in innovating, but rather a decline in annual diffusing of methods and products that, had, that already had a pioneering adoption or two. But in the long run, a rise in the lag between first adoption and full penetration would have no effect on the rate of growth of TFP, total factor productivity. So the latter, over a long span, remains a good estimate of the rate of innovation over that span. Recent work by Mike Ferroli of the University of Chicago contributes a new test of the decline hypothesis. A fall in the rate of innovation that is embodied in new, in particular innovation that is embodied in new equipment can be expected to reduce the rate at which two-year-old equipment obsolete, uh, has obsolesced as measured by its price relative to the price 
of brand new equipment. Data on prices of information processing equipment show that this obsolescence ran around 12 or 13 percent from 1973 to 1977. But in the past three or four years, the rate of obsolescence has been considerably less, less than uh, 10 percent per annum. Unfortunately, uh, Feroli didn't go back to the 60s and 50s, which is what we really want. But um, I thought the notion of, of this obsolescence would be interesting to, to throw out. Now the other uh, section here is <coughs> has to do with the causes of things. <coughs> <coughs> and here's where I start searching for shifts in values. My book had to depend on cultural evidence to support its hypothesis that the slow accretion of modern values led finally to the breakout of modern economies beginning around 1815 after the Napoleonic War and continuing uh, uh, economies that uh, went uh, full tilt until uh, 1940 in the case of the U.S., even to the early 19, uh, in 1940 in all cases, and, and uh, to the early 60s in, uh, in, in the U.S. What was this cultural evidence? It was mainly, uh, the evidence was mainly the uh, modernism that came to uh, music, to fiction, and painting which I explore in uh, one of the chapters of the book. Incidentally, uh, Jackie Wolschlager, the art critic, says that modernism uh, dominated painting between 1860 to 1930. That's a pretty close match to uh, what I call the modern economy. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> thanks to Google, we have data on the frequency of various words and phrases in English and in American English. Some of these words can be used as proxies or maybe as instrumental variables uh, for the prevalence of various values in Britain and, um, and in America. Um, I had learned about the Ngram database in uh, 2000. Uh, 11, but there was no response when I requested the data. So um, I've been playing catch up. This spring, when I learned through a reference to work by Daniel Klein that the data had been released, I discussed it with Jeff Nagy, my assistant at the center, though my book was closed at that time, so we really couldn't uh, think of uh, using it. <clears throat> it was already on the edge of being thrown out of Princeton University Press. Um, to my astonishment, it took only a minute uh, for Jeff to present to me a time series of the frequency of the word flourishing since 1800. I think it was 1800. Jeff, was it 1800? Do you remember? We didn't have time to locate this, um, <laughs> get this thing up on, on the screen today. Everything has been a bit rushed recently. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there seems, though, to have been a, a peak in the rate of freq in the frequency of that word around uh, 1840s. Very high, very high frequency of that word in the 1840s and 1850s. Yeah, who, who would have known that? just at the time when Lincoln was exclaiming about novelty. <clears throat> the book also found data that gives some evidence of a resurgence of some traditional values in the 1960s and beyond. Traditional values that the book argues inhibited would-be innovators or discouraged them with hurdles and barriers. Do the data on use of words and phrases suggest such a resurgence? 
I think we're going to hear from Raicho on, on, on something like that question. But um, I have had a chance uh, just in the past day uh, to look more carefully at a paper that crossed my desk about a month ago by Mark Egnall, probably not pronounced that way, but that's the way it's spelled, uh, Evolution of the Novel in the United States. <clears throat> the author, Egnall, sees a new order arising in what he calls the postmodern era, which he dates from 1960. He notes an explosion of the words shit and fuck. I just thought uh, that it ought to be on the record, even though I can't figure out its relationship to innovation. Uh, he also reports that in postmodern books, the use of mother has surpassed that of father. And he notes, he emphasizes the celebration of ties between parents and children, and the sharply increased references after 1960 to nurturing and toddler. And then he cites important novels that are centered on the, the tie between children and parents in books by Toni Morrison and Philip Roth and Cormac McCarthy and so forth. So that seems to fit pretty well with my hypothesis that traditional values have enjoyed a resurgence and they must be inhibiting people from saying, Mom, I'm going away to the other side of the earth, to Shanghai, to make my career there. Uh, that, that was something you could do in the 19th century, uh, but I, th I think now it's becoming har harder to do. So let me just conclude with this uh, thought. From the 1970s to the end of the 20th century, it would have been unthinkable of economists in MIT as much as Chicago to consider values as the great force driving innovation. They would have thought of tax rates and perhaps scientific breakthroughs. Now it is perfectly thinkable, and for some of us, perfectly plausible. Thanks. Okay. So good morning, and uh, uh, the paper that I'm going to present uh, today is uh, part of an ongoing research project whose objective is to incorporate the uh, Google Engram database in an attempt to study the relation between uh, economic performance and what Ned would call economic culture. Now, I see, as you have, yes, of course. All right, uh, you see that uh, uh, the first thing that we have seen today is that uh, I have problems dealing with modern technology. So let's go back to the, uh, to the uh, introduction, okay. You have already seen everything. So uh, the uh, starting point and the motivation of uh, this research project is the realization that over the last uh, 20, 25, 30 years, uh, there has been uh, uh, persistent, there have been persistent and large differences in the economic performance of uh, uh, developed countries. And classic economic, uh, classical economic theory has uh, great difficulty explaining those in terms of differences in uh, economic endowments or access to uh, technology. So what are the possible alternative explanations? Uh, one uh, explanation is based on institutions and in the first session that point has been already mentioned. Now here what I'm going to do is I'm going to advance an alternative view which is based on uh, economic culture. And this idea was originally uh, advanced by and uh, proposed by uh, Ned in a paper uh, of his uh, written in uh, 2006. And the way 
I think we should think about economic culture is uh, the following. It, economic culture represents a set of prevailing economic beliefs and attitudes and they provide the motivation and uh, the uh, basis for the actions that people take and the actions of course lead to outcomes that we observe which we call economic performance. Okay. Now, without further ado, what I'm going to do today, as I already suggested, is I'm going to present uh, uh, the uh, Google Ngram database. I'm going to show you some preliminary results that we have. And uh, I will conclude with a review of a set of um, things that we should do in the future in order to explore the full potential of this database. So without further ado, the data that uh, uh, Google, that I'm going to describe, comes from Google Books and it is uh, based on the, the scanned copies of 5.2 million books published between uh, 1550 and 2008. And so the last update was, uh, of this database was in July 2012. For each book, we know in which language it was uh, written, the year in which it was published, and the place of publication. Most of these books were uh, written in English, and the fact that we know the place of publication means in particular that we can distinguish between uh, books which were uh, published in the United States and those that were published in the UK. What is important to point out here is that indeed this data set is indicative more of what people read in the country than what people write. Because, and that is particularly the case for the US in the early uh, centuries because most of the books that were published in the United States were, uh, and before that in the colonies, were actually reprints of things that have already been published in the uh, UK. So the database contains uh, the total number of times each word has been used alone or in particular phrases of uh, length of up to five words and uh, uh, in each particular year. And uh, what is particularly interesting is that we can indeed condition, the u we can study the, co the, the context in which uh, those words were used. So there exist some conditioning operators, as it is already indicated on the slide, that allow us, for example, to say that you know, we can condition the use of word, uh, of the word A, um, in the co by uh, the word B. So for example, book with this uh, therefore sign, good means that the book, book is qualified by the word good. And that in a sense gives us a lot of flexibility about the, of, uh, for the usage of this data set. We can, get the, we can study the context in which a particular word is used, whether it is in the sense of actual state of affairs, is it in the sense of demand or excess or shortage of uh, the uh, phenomenon and so on. So we have a huge data set with thousands of words and we have to make sense of it. So the simplest thing that one can try to do is would like to assemble a set of words which are related to economic life and then we'd like to essentially plot the dynamics of the usage of, the, of those words uh, over time. Still, okay, we have to deal with huge number of variables. So a sensible way of proceeding is actually to apply what is known as factor analysis which simply tries to extract the co-movement of words of similar meaning uh, and uh, uh, in this way essentially what we are doing is we are summarizing the, uh, the common thread, the common um, context in the, in the use of those words. So I have done that uh, in, uh, on two levels. I have uh, grouped uh, words in a logically consistent way or in a uh, setting which is uh, based on their linguistic similarity. And the other way that I have done it, and then I have run the factor analysis, and the other uh, uh, thing that I have done is I have not imposed uh, my will on the data. I have just pooled all words for the period between 1900 and 2008, and I have 
apply this factor analysis, uh, uh, this statistical uh, uh, analysis called factor, factor analysis to this huge pool of data with the hope that there are going to be a few dimensions that are going to describe the prevailing themes in the um, uh, American uh, discourse uh, in the context of economics. Okay? What is important here to point out is that all the results are normalized by the total number of words which have been published in each year. This is done in order to control for the fact that over time there is a growing tendency of writing more and more books. Okay? So, let us start with the results. Here I'm showing one figure which we can use for the purposes of illustration in order to make sense of the following figures. So, just let's pick one word at random, for example, innovation, and uh, let's have a look at that. By the way, that was a joke. So, if we look at the innovation, there is a vertical and horizontal axis. So horizontal axis is basically years, it's time. And on the vertical axis, we have the number of times a word is used as a percentage of the total number of published words. So just out of curiosity, let us just have a look at this uh, index. And what we're going to find is that there is a lot, there is really considerable growth in the relative usage of the word innovation after the, uh, during the Second World War and the years after the Second World War up to the 1970s. And then afterwards, basically, its usage has reached a plateau, which has not been actually affected by the uh, IT revolution of the uh, uh, 1990s. So here is another example that we have chosen at random. This is the index of uh, the word venture. Now venture here is in the sense of verb, not in the sense of, it, of noun. So that illustrates another, another good feature of the uh, Google engrams, and it is that we can condition on the part of speech in we, uh, that uh, relates to the, um, on the part of speech um, of, uh, in, in, in which the, 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 the keyword of interest is used. Okay? So what we see here is basically almost steady decline of the word venture for the period between 1900 and 2008. There is sharp decline in the first 20 years of the century, then it's kind of stable during the first half of the 1920s, then there is another decline during the Great Depression, then it is kind of stable in the 30s, 40s, well actually 40s and 50s, and then in the 70s there is another big decline. It seems that the use of this word, its relative importance, has increased over the last, uh, you know, 10 years. So these are uh, tables that illustrate the uh, first type of indices that I just described. We are collecting in subsets words which uh, have a close in the linguistic sense or in terms of meaning. And we extract the common variance or the co-movement of, of, the, of the use of these words. And that is what is plotted on those figures. Now, the next type of thing that I do in order to summarize the data, to give you a flavor about this kind of subjective beliefs and attitudes that Americans hold about economic life, is actually to pool all of the data together and to apply the same statistical procedure. What I find is that there are five uh, indices, or in the language of uh, factor analysis, uh, five factors, okay? that summarize the main dimensions um, of the uh, discourse in uh, the economic discourse in the United States in the studied period. So one of them is I call vitalism. Now this name is a little bit arbitrary, I have given it, and uh, the reason is because it turns out that this index represents predominantly intellectual curiosity, a preference for interesting, unusual, unexplained situations, a desire to leap in the unknown, to discover new worlds, to explore new possibilities, 
to venture into the unknown, etc., etc. Okay. So what do we see? What uh, this figure suggests is that this uh, index of vitalism grew actually in the first 20 years of the uh, 20th century. Then it stabilized. There was a little bit of fluctuation during the Second World War. But then after the war, there has been a steady slow initially, but then uh, so, uh, you know, uh, um, gradually accelerating decline in the uh, index of vitalism over time, particularly in the 1970s and then in the late 1990s, early 2000s. The other index, aggregate index, that uh, I find to summarize the beliefs and attitudes of Americans in the cultural context is the index of entrepreneurship. So this index, in contrast to the preceding one, loads heavily or represents uh, wor uh, words or, uh, such as achievement, challenge, change, engaging work, improvement, restless, try again, second chance, new product, novelty, entrepreneur, etc. So this index I've called entrepreneurship because it seems to capture really well the Schumpeterian concept of entrepreneurship. You know, the entrepreneurs are just people who wake up, they get their coffee, they open the morning newspaper, and they see opportunities. And when they see opportunities, they simply cannot help themselves. They just go there and they exploit them. They have to take advantage of those things. Okay? This is not the same as waking up in the morning with the curiosity to explore, to, to create something new, to tinker with existing products. Okay? It is just the desire to take advantage of, to exploit existing opportunities. And you see that this, that basically this American uh, feature, this desire to take advantage of opportunities, to explore opportunities, is alive and well. It's been growing continuously during the 20th century with a s slowdown towards the end of the century and a little bit of decline at the beginning of the 21st. The next index is the index of traditional values. Now here, in contrast to what has been previously mentioned, I find that traditional values have been continuously declining in the United States with slight resurgence towards the end of the 20th century, the beginning of, of the 21st, with the biggest declines happening in, at the beginning of the century and then afterwards uh, uh, in the 1970s, okay, with the small surge in the late 1960s. So as you may, exa uh, as you may suspect, those, uh, this kind of index represents family and community values, diligence, honesty, trust, social trust, responsibility, respect for the authorities and traditions. The next index is my favorite one, the corporatism. And here what we see is that uh, the, idea of, the ideas of corporatism are alive and well also in the, are also alive and well in the United States, and actually they've been growing quite a lot since the 1960s. Okay? They've been continuously uh, increasing in terms of their importance. Uh, the index has been continuously increasing in terms of its relevance to the American economic discourse, but I have to say that uh, its composition has changed quite a lot over the last 20 to 30 years. So up to the 1970s, 1980s, the most important variables that uh, enter in this corporatist index are job security, stability, government intervention, and so on. Over the last 20, 30 years, what becomes increasingly fashionable is ideas like corporate responsibility, social partnership, fair trade and such concepts. So what we see is that in a sense there is a greater, uh, there is a decline in the direct involvement or desire for direct involvement in the state uh, and that is replaced by a willingness for cooperation among social partners, um, stakeholders and so on. And the final index which I find to be very important for the uh, economic uh, uh, life and discourse about economic life in the United States is something which, for the lack of a better term, I call index of distress. 
And that is related to uh, uh, a sociological, essentially to a finding from a sociological study that was mentioned at the, in the first session. And it reflects basically dysfunctional social behavior, um, desire for instant gratification, consumerism, um, instability, as I said, dysfunctional, you know, family or social behavior is very important. Words associated with that are included here. And what we see is that since the Second World War, this index has experienced a steady growth. That's been particularly strong during the Second World War and then after in the 50s, in the 60s, it has kind of slowed down over the last uh, 20, 30 years, but uh, it is it's a quite high level compared to what it was before the Great Depression. So, on this figure, what I do, I compare basically the aggregate index of vitalism and entrepreneurship. And what you see is that vitalism is in blue, entrepreneurship is in red. So what we see is that there is this kind of an X crossing. Vitalism seems to have been declining over the last 20, 30 years entrepreneurship has been doing well. We can do the same exercise for traditional values in corporatism, and we see that corporatism has been increasing over the last 30, 40 years, and traditional values have been in general in decline with a small you know, uh, uh, surge in the last uh, 50, 10, to f uh, 10 to 15 years. And now finally, let's put on the same figure uh, the index of vitalism and uh, entrepreneurship, along with our previously shown economic um, index of economic innovation. And we see that, in a sense, it seems that the decline in vitalism could not be compensated by the increase in entrepreneurship. So the increase in entrepreneurship and the decline of vitalism, in a sense, this figure suggests the hypothesis that dynamism the decline, I'm sorry, in vitalism could not be compensated by the increase in entrepreneurship, and as a result, the, the innovation has stalled over the last uh, 30 to 40 years. So, this, what have, uh, what have we seen? We have seen a couple of pretty pictures, but as Richard suggested at the beginning, the key problem with the study of economic culture is essentially causality. And the framework that I have originally suggested you know, implies a dynamic relationship between culture and uh, outcomes. So my beliefs today are definitely going to affect my, my actions and therefore future outcomes. But it is also the case that past outcomes would affect my beliefs today. So there is this kind of dynamics which is very difficult to study with cross-sectional survey data or even panel data. The data that I just described is, has, is time series, is based on time series, and it is ideally suited exactly for the study of this kind of dynamic relation with the small proviso. This is aggregate data, it's not individual data, so if one would like to be serious, she or he would have to model the aggregation of individual beliefs and attitudes in these aggregate indices that I have just shown to you. There are a few additional things that need to be done with this data. The first of one, uh, the first uh, of these, is that um, uh, we need to study the use of all these words in in their context in order to really capture to explore the f the full richness of the possibilities that these data um, uh, allow uh, have. So the other thing is that the choice, of, uh, the choice of keywords and phrases should be in a sense automatic. At the moment I have been done you know, semi-automatic uh, selection of those words on the basis of the work of Ned and his book on uh, mass flourishing. But in a sense, this gives uncomfortable power of the researcher in the choice of you know, what enters in the data set and what doesn't. Okay? And then the other thing, which is kind of important, is that at the moment, a, a weakness of these data is the fact that we cannot control for the popularity of published work. We, con we can control basically for you know, items that have been published, but not by, for the number of copies that these items have been published. So 
potentially, if we have access to unlimited uh, uh, cheap undergraduate or graduate labor force, what we can do is we can actually s see which are the titles that in which the words have been used, and then we can actually track the sales or some other data. We can link sale data for books, particularly in the last, say, 50 years, with the titles. And in a sense, we can also measure the impact that each of those words has had in terms of the number of sold copies. And finally, here we have not controlled basically for general trends in the use of language. Right? The language evolves, particularly the English language, and some words slightly, you know, slowly fade away in terms of their usage. So in conclusion, I would like to state that I've just presented to you a new data source which has exciting possibilities for the study of the relation between economic culture and uh, economic performance, in particular the dynamic nature of this interaction, of this relation. And uh, the next thing is basically that I have shown to you that the data seems to suggest that what we call index of vitalism has been declining over time. The index of traditional values has also been declining. Corporatist ideas have been on the rise and uh, uh, what I call the index of distress has been also alarmingly increasing over the last 30 to 40 years. So as I said, the next phase, are basic, the next uh, steps are going to be to, the, to determine the context of the use of the words, expand the set of words which enter in our data set, and eventually include non-English uh, publications when uh, once the uh, Google finishes the scanning of those items. So this is it. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Dan Klein, and Phil's going to put my PowerPoint presentation up. Um, I was delighted, I am delighted to be here and to be invited. Um, I had written a paper doing engrams uh, prior to, you know, uh, the plan, well, prior to any intention to include me in this conference. And my paper for this conference is pretty much uh, an adaptation of that, and the paper is not directed towards the addressing innovation at all. Uh, and so I don't really do that in my presentation here, but presumably some connection is seen by somebody. So <clears throat> thank you. Um, yeah, so. Cultural trends as seen in engrams, Carl Polanyi with a Hayekian twist. There are two cultural trends I want to show with engrams and show in Carl Polanyi's thinking. One is sort of the modern modernity trend, um, the complexification of society and hence of morals and moral discourse. And I show that from, say, 1750, there's a decline in the use of terms that presuppose a shared communal sense of the lines of propriety. You'll see what I mean by that. And then, from about 1880, a rise in the use of terms that reflect the increasing governmentalization of social affairs. <clears throat> What I mean by the increase in governmentalization of social affairs is more government restrictions on voluntary private action, higher taxes, and governmental big players, government institutions as employers, benefactors, big players in commerce, industry, finance, and life in general. <clears throat> cultural, their, their place in cultural institutions, credential givers, and so on. And these trends fit the great transformation, I think, pretty well. He says about society before the coming of commercial society, the institutional pattern of centricity provides a track for the collection, storage, and redistribution of goods and services. The members of a hunting tribe usually deliver the game to the headman for redistribution. The economic system is, in effect, a mere function of social organization. 
He says, all systems known to us up to the end of feudalism in Western Europe were organized on the principles of reciprocity or redistribution or householding. These principles were institutionalized with help of a social organization <clears throat> which made use of the patterns of symmetry, centricity, and autarky. And then he speaks of the coming commercial society and the transformation it engendered. For example, machine production in commercial society involves a transformation of the natural and human substance of society into commodities. The dislocation caused by such devices must disjoint man's relationships and threaten his natural habitat with annihilation. Economic liberalism was the organizing principle of a society engaged in creating a market system. The cause of the degradation is the disintegration of the cultural environment of the victim. Finally, the immediate cause of his undoing lies in the lethal injury to the institutions in which his social existence is embodied. The result is loss of self-respect and standards. So with that word standards, I kind of relate to this sense of a, the ability, really, for people to presuppose a common sense of standards and using words that really depend on such a presupposition. Now, there are countless others, of course, you could cite for this trend of modernity or complexification and so on. Uh, but I, I find um, Polanyi particularly interesting uh, in the way he talks about two movements. We're now talking about the first movement. And the evidence um, is simple engrams. Fortunately, Ryko, is that your, how I pronounce your name? Has covered what these are, so I don't need to say much, and maybe we'll save some time. An engram is this, and actually an engram is a generalization for some, more specific would be a three gram. A three gram is a string of three words such as the Great War. So what this percentage here is, is the percent of all three grams in those millions of books that are the Great War. And we don't go and look, well, we don't necessarily go and look at the texts to see exactly how the terms are used, but I do think you can sometimes see what's happening and see important trends just by these pictures. Here you can see that a war came, they called it the Great War, and then another war came, and they stopped calling it the Great War. So here are some of those terms that presuppose the lines of propriety. Plain, plain talk, like from mom and dad, should, ought, duty. This is generally from 1750. I know you can't see it there. There's a handout, by the way. <clears throat> goodness to the good, good conduct, bad conduct. This manner of speaking just seems to have been in decline for some 250, 300 years, at least. I didn't go back further than that. Virtue, propriety, conduct as a noun. This is that conditioning that Ryko talked about on conduct as opposed to the wires conduct electricity. <clears throat> Prudence, benevolence, diligence, fortitude, some of the staple uh, virtues. Big declines there. Wisdom, wise, judgment with both spellings. So again, he spoke of the victim's undoing lying in the damage to his uh, social existence. The result is loss of self-respect and standards. And I think these words reflect that there was a loss of standards in the sense of a common standard, an understanding, or maybe a convention of where uh, lines of propriety, good and bad conduct would lie. <clears throat> and then he speaks of the reaction to commercial society and liberal principle. Yet simultaneously, a counter movement was on foot. It was a reaction against the dislocation which attacked the fabric of society. The counter move against economic liberalism possessed all the unmistakable characteristics of a spontaneous reaction. Social protection set in, he said. It's interesting, Ned, that you used that term 
on your thing, social protection, because that's, that's kind of how he summarizes this, this second great transformation, which is actually the one he means when he uses the term great transformation the two times he uses that term in the book. Politically, the nation's identity was established by the government. Economically, it was vested in the central bank. So here are words reflecting um, what, I'm, what I call, he doesn't, well, he, he more or less does, but what I call the governmentalization of social affairs um, and, and reflecting mentalities suited to that. Um, this is a neat example. The, the yellow and green lines are showing the United States is and the United States has singular verbs, is and has, whereas the red and blue lines are the United States are and the United States have. And so around 1880, it starts where people think more and more about a unified national polity when they say the United States rather than a plural noun. And of course, you can look at any of the institutions that come, income tax, public school system, Pledge of Allegiance, you could go on and on with all these agencies and such. <clears throat> Here's some other general terms, government control, government regulation, these are picking up here, you can't see, but it's picking up generally in 1880, 1890, it's starting. I think there's a, a, a huge tide, cultural tide that turns, it doesn't, it begins to turn then and then its effects take a long time. I'm not saying that all of a sudden there was this governmentalization. If you look at, say, the history of occupational licensing or the Food and Drug Administration, there's these accretions with, you know, 1906 and 1938 with drugs, and then 1962 and then 1976 with devices. So it takes up until these er more recent eras for the tentacles, if you will, uh, you know, to get as far along as they've gotten. It's not as though they, they were all put in place in 1900. But you see the roots of this, this, the cultural roots going way back. Again, I think basically to the time when uh, the term liberalism changed its meaning. Regulate business. Term suited to the mentality of governmentalization like run the country, lead the country, lead the nation national unity, social unity, social justice, economic justice. These terms had no currency before 1880. Forced to work, you see how much that went up. Equal opportunity, equality of opportunity, almost no currency before 1880. Economic inequality, same thing. Living wage, same thing. <clears throat> Bundle of rights, this very plastic theory of property, which lends itself to sort of permitting and excusing restrictions on ownership. Somehow, you know, it's, that really starts about 1880. Nationalism, collectivism. So Polanyi speaks of a double movement, the two trends we're talking about. Our own interpretation of the double movement is, we find, borne out by the evidence, for if market economy was a threat to the human and natural components of the social fabric, as we insisted, what else would one expect than an urge on the part of a great variety of people to press for some sort of protection? This is what we found. And interestingly, he notes the concord with his narrative with that of liberals. Liberal writers like Spencer and Sumner, Mises and Lippmann offer an account of the double movement substantially similar to our own, but they put an entirely different interpretation on it. While in our view, the concept of a self-regulating market was utopian and its progress was stopped by the realistic self-protection of society, in their view, all protection was a mistake. <clears throat> And he describes how the liberals saw things. To the liberals, he said, Western Europe was passing through a new enlightenment and high amongst its bugbears ranked the tribalistic concept of the nation whose alleged sovereignty was to liberals an outcrop of parochial thinking. Now, there's a lot about 
Polanyi I disagree with and I think is unreliable. But the broad narrative I like, I, I mean I kind of accept, I buy. Um, and there's certainly truth, some truth to what he says about how liberals saw the counter move. And here I want to look, speak just very briefly about Hayek, who diagnosed modern statism. And he saw that the cradle of human instinct is the small band, uh, you know, ending in the upper Paleolithic some 10,000 years ago. Not the tribe, which is, come, really comes after and begins to get hierarchical um, um, and then turns into nations. Hayek had a much better sense, better that is than Spencer and Sumner and Mises certainly, of sentiment and epistemics. And in his diagnosis, if you will, he talks about a kind of ethos and mentality which I call the band man ethos and mentality. That's not his term. This is kind of a summary and again, some of these terms are not particularly his, uh, they're more particularly mine. Uh, very egalitarian and democratic, a yearning for shared experience, a yearning for encompassing sentiment, some encompassment among the people, the true set of us, solidarity, society as an organization, uh, social justice as the sense of justice, and again, a yearning or maybe aspiration for common knowledge. And so he put forth this kind of diagnosis. He was trying to understand why people, you know, were so favorable to um, the growth of government as opposed to classical liberalism. And he saw modern statism as basically an atavistic reassertion of band man mentalities and instincts. Now, <clears throat> this word atavism has to be understood as pejorative. It's not merely that these tendencies that he's talking about, these ones like here, which I think we see in the political discourse all the time, it's not merely that those things are built on primeval instincts and yearnings. That's not what makes, that's not sufficient to make them atavism. It's that they don't suit the circumstances, that the, these tendencies are wrong-headed or irresponsible. That's when we call it an, atav uh, an atavism. An atavism is a pejorative. It's saying it's too much. Okay, because everything is built on these primeval, primeval instincts and yearnings. Really, you know, that's that's kind of what we have to work with. <clears throat> now, democracy plays a big role in this, um, and the timing fits perfectly in terms of the spread of democracy and the ideals of democracy. And you see this in this expression. It's kind of remarkable how this term again had absolutely no currency before about 1890. Um, so whether you like Hayek or Polanyi or neither, uh, the engrams seem to provide evidence of these two trends. Again, they are that from, say, 1750, there's a decline in use of terms that presuppose a shared communal sense of the lines of propriety and a rise in the use of terms that reflect the increasing governmentalization of social affairs. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me, Ned Phelps. Uh, the last time I was uh, <laughs> invited to, the, to discuss something by Ned Phelps, I, I overslept, so I'm, I'm glad I made it. He reminded me of that a few weeks ago, so <laughs> I'll never forget it. Here we are in their chateau with a, you know, all the name boards and all the famous people in an empty spot for, for me. So it was about rewarding work, which was... Uh... <laughs> anyway, so um, here it is on, on Hasid Klein set in. I've got three papers to discuss. Basically, it's, uh, it's all based on the work of Ned Phelps and the, and, the, uh, and the book he's written and then the attempts to try to get some data to underlie these changes. So when I'm discussing stuff, I always like to start with, uh, with, with the main question, what have, I, what have I learned? And it's that uh, kind of human progression, productivity growth uh, isn't a Petri dish. It's about, it's about culture. Um, so culture is the, is the driving thing that's moving, and it's kind of an interesting uh, movement of man. I don't know whether they're falling or rising. It depends on, on how you twist it. Um, but for economists, this is you know, quite a leap to start looking at productivity growth. And rather than looking at the, at, at the obvious uh, short-term and longer-term incentives, how you get people working, what the, what the wages are, what the prices are, uh, what the institutional environment is lately, now we're going uh, to culture. Um, and the long run, 
idea here is to try to see what's going to happen in the future. Can we look at trends in the past and try to look forward uh, what's happening uh, to this era of mass flourishing? Um, and this is, a, as Gilfie Zweigen said before, a very difficult thing to do. Um, projecting a long-run productivity growth requires a lot of steps, and it's unclear that we can do them all. So, so the first one is theorizing about the underlying exogenous drivers. And I think the, the book is just marvelous in reading through and, and looking at uh, you know, what made it come up in the first place, this modernism, uh, then what are the counter forces, uh, where is it heading, uh, how does it correlate to, to arts, to science, to the way people live. I mean, I really find that you know, much better than the lectures I got here as a, as a graduate student 30 years ago, which were you know, learned a lot about nothing. Um, the next two papers are about finding measures to capture these underlying drivers, these changes in values, and these, this, this movement of culture over time. Uh, what I'd like to then see is, you know, these are fairly new measures. These m-grams have been only around for a couple of years. Um, is some validation for these measures? Do they measure what we think they're doing? Well, the Great War, we've got some 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 clues. Other ones are more tenuous. Do we do we think that this is uh, is usable? Once you've got measures that you validated, you've got a theory to design the measures. Then you've got measures that are validated. Then we try to see do they correlate with the things we're interested in learning. In this about in this case, productivity growth and innovation. Is there, is there a correlation uh, at the micro level, at the macro level, over time, or in the cross section? Um, then we'd, even better, be able to test our theory. So there you need some exogenous variation. You need some experiments, randomized trials. We, we can barely do in the long historical overviews. But we need some way of identifying cause and effect of dealing with the fact, that are these drivers really exogenous? Um, oh, lovely. Is it coming back? Yes. Um, what about selectivity? And I'll get back to that. And then finally is the, the, the most difficult step, which is to then forecast. And we've already talked about this before. Um, you know, kind of the best you can do is to straight line some trends you've seen in the past. And, and who knows uh, what the future is going to bring. So about the theory, what I, uh, you know, I, I put this book in, in the row of some, some famous and popular books, Jared Diamond's Gun, Germs, and Steel. You know, I, I show it to all my first year students. Uh, I don't actually discuss it, but I say read this before you start thinking about uh, long run history and growth. Uh, recently, Asimoglu and Robinson, uh, it's kind of the flip side. It's why nations fail. It's not what caused the flourishing. It's what, what can go wrong, and it's written from that point of view. Um, in this book, the emphasis is, is, is on the innovation and on the innovative process, and this idea of flourishing really does go beyond just innovation. It goes about the way people feel in their lives. So it does go and talk about, you know, economists would call it utility. I think Ned Phillips doesn't really like the word, but it's something broad about human well-being uh, that we're trying to measure. And it's not just a couple of people that are having well-being, but it's, it's mass flourishing. So when I compare the uh, Asimoglu and Robinson, well, the, the Jared Diamond is kind of deterministic. It's a, it's a fate of geography and, and genetics and, and uh, you know, where the crops and, and the, uh, the animals were amenable to uh, husbandry. Um, but in, in Asimoglu and Robinson and in Phillips, uh, the things that are the drivers are man-made. Institutions are made either by choice or by a dictator or whatever. Uh, culture also somehow evolves, moves, and changes. Um, in these, I would think that culture seems prior to institutions. Um, but it's really hard. I'm not, I'm not absolutely certain of that. I mean, just listen to the evidence, I would say it's prior. But then the real question is, how do they, how do they evolve? How do they change? Uh, are they exogenous? What is the, you know, they're not. So then what are the feedback loops? What's driving what? And, and here I really uh, don't, you know, I, I'd say this is a place to start thinking and talking about this. Uh, Asimoglu and Robinson have done a lot of work to talk about, you know, coming up with data and experiments to show when the institutions, you know, what's the exogeneity that caused certain institutions in one place and then certain in another. I think with the culture, we're going to have to think of similar ways to try to disentangle. Uh, and I think a country with lots of migrants, and so the U.S., has lots of movements in culture. In marketing, 
people have, marketing uses this culture stuff a lot, people have looked at, at the evolution of adoption of types of mayonnaise across regions in the U.S. as people move from one region to the other, they've got their scanner data data, and you can track how long does it take someone from the, from the West to start using Hellman's mayonnaise in the East. Uh, they do it also with coffee, I guess Maxwell House and Folgers are the two brands that have a geographical divide. And they try to see how long do people hold their old values. Um, so, so this isn't really new, it's new to macroeconomists, but in, in, in business uh, this is used, the, the, the idea of culture. Not only looking at your workforce in the firm, but in marketing and getting people to, to uh, eat the dog food, or dogs to eat the dog food, I guess. Um, so there's, there's evidence from the, uh, the World Values Survey, and this is the stuff that, uh, that's used in the book uh, by Reiko and, and Ned Phelps. Uh, it's been run for, I guess, 20 years now in 30 or 40 countries. They have surveys where they ask people lots of stuff about the way they feel about their work themselves, their parents, their home, what's important in life. Um, we're now new seeing the, the new evidence from the Google Engrams. I, I withstood the, uh, the urge to be poking all night last night on the Engrams, coming up with examples. I think, I think you've seen, I think we've seen enough of them. Um, uh, Looking at engrams is really fun. There's another game on internet called GeoGuessr. They give you a picture of a place in the world, and you've got to kind of, you can move your little man around and then pick on the globe, spin the globe and pick where you think you are. And the closer you are to where you think you are, the, uh, the more points you get. So that's another great time waster. Um, so I didn't do the engrams, but I do think that there's, um, there's some interesting stuff there. The, the, the difference between vitalism and entrepreneurship, I'd really like to learn more about. So in the methodology, I'd like to know more about what do you exactly do? How do you disentangle the two? And I thought Ned Phelps' slide showing the different characteristics was better. I don't quite see that back yet in, in how it was done. Um, the corporatism, statism, so I think these are all quite interesting. I'd like to know more about how the distress and fear uh, plays a role in innovation and I was here a few weeks ago uh, visiting Ned Phelps uh, at Columbia and we talked about the distress and fear and I had the point of view well the US grosses in, in fear that's what you know controls society they've been really pushing fear for the last 20 30 years the news does it every night families are afraid it's what driving and he's like oh no it's in Europe where fear uh, is actually changing the way children grow up they're all afraid of going out and learning how to play on the playground so I think the anecdotes and the, and the data, we're going to have to learn how to, how to follow this, but I do think it's an important one. Now, this is not the first work, so thoughts on future work. I think uh, in this game, you need to look at Hofstede's book, uh, Cultural Consequences in 1981 and Culture and Organizations 1991. Um, one of these books has 19,000 Google citations already, um, so I think some of the best papers of some of us might have a thousand or two thousand. I mean, this has 19,000 uh, citations. Um, culture is, uh, you know, he defines it unwritten rules of the social game, a collective programming of the mind. It tells you about the endogeneity. In this, originally there were four dimensions of culture, now there are six. And I think we should, it's probably worthwhile to use some of these or at least look at them as well, because they might get you uh, as much mileage and at least you can hook into an existing literature. In these dimensions, one, one idea is long-term orientation, and these are dimensions of national culture. Indulgence versus restraint. How does society allow, you know, does society allow people to indulge or are they held back? Um, uncertainty avoidance, the security stuff. A collectivism, individualism is another one. Uh, male, female. You know, the, how often do you quote mother versus father? Uh, you can have this in whether society has, has masculine or feminine attitudes. So I think one step is to start looking at this. The two is to um, worry about the selectivity over time, and I think uh, the, the uh, speaker mentioned this already, but the, the number of people that had access to publishing technologies and the type of people that had access to publishing technologies was very different in 1750 and in 1900 and in 1980. So uh, that's one big issue, and I, I would prefer, I think, that you looked at one type of corpus, maybe novels, or, one, or academic books, or limit it to a, to get rid of that selectivity of the types of books. Now there are cooks books, business books, lots of other stuff. The next one you mentioned yourself, you'd like to get a, a, a reader weighted uh, count. So how many people saw this book? Um, 
I don't know how, how to get at that. Um, oh, that went too fast. Okay, so worry about that. And then things about shifts in culture. So we really want to know, does the nature of the technological change cause changes in culture? And here's where I'd like to propose an alternate view. And one is I'd start just saying, well, I think a doubling of productivity in the next generation is quite possible. I do think that the nature of technology is actually changing the required virtues for further growth. So it's true that we are not having the culture and values we had in 1860 to generate the growth that 1860 had, but it's because the place we're in te with technology now, we might need a completely different set of virtues and values to make it work in the future. And I think the big point is that intangible knowledge capital is a different type of thing than, than the tinkering and the innovations we had before. This stuff is non-rivaling use. In our economic models, what makes it different is that the marginal cost to society of someone using that stuff is zero. And our whole pricing system doesn't work with that. So we really need to rethink rewards, market systems, how we exchange the stuff called, called knowledge. We really don't have, and so possibly we need a, another transformation uh, to work with this new technology that we have. Okay? Property rights may not be the proper way to generate efficiency. They may actually be undermining the incentive to innovate. Okay? Corporatism and indulgence may actually be the virtues you need. Why do you need indulgence? Because innovation is driven by users. You need users to say, hey, this is cool, give it to me now. Okay? Indulgence may be exactly the thing that my kids have that's driving this new stuff to occur quickly. It's crowd-created innovation. Uh, corporatism may help because to make this stuff work, other things need to be in good shape. You need to have the networks. You need to have uh, you know, uh, distribution systems with open network provisions and access for people. You need to have the, you know, the, your infrastructure in shape. So lots of these, oh, I think we need to rethink uh, lots of this stuff and we need to th rethink what types of values will work given the nature of technology that we're exploiting now. So that's how I'd close off. I'd never heard of these n-grams. They're just simply amazing. Uh, and I, I, but it did make me wonder, sort of, uh, it's an innovation. It is an innovation which presumably enriched Jeff's life compared to the life of an assistant 15 or 20 years ago. It is an innovation where most of the value is captured as consumer surplus. It is a general purpose technology. Uh, and as far as, so are, is the n-gram kind of innovation an exception to the decline that Ned observes uh, or not? I have, I have used n-grams, I must admit, but I'm actually going to raise a question about n-grams, and I'm going to use this as an, use an example. Suppose you did an n-gram on some factor of the words heretic, heresy, apostasy, blasphemy, and a bunch of words like that. And the question is, if you looked at since 1600, as I have actually done, you see something really amazing, which is it goes down and down and down. The wrong conclusion, God knows, is that we no longer bear the name of the Lord in vain. It's just that we no longer care mentioning it because it's become part of the culture. And, you know, being accused of blasphemy is not something on which I could use my tenure. But in the 17th century, you could. Yes. 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 Speaking of the Bible, you know, of the making of many books, there is no end. <laughs> yeah, Patricia. <clears throat> Yeah, I'll have to read it for the sake of my Spanglish. Um, Ned uh, referred to, um, as income grows, values related to quality of life decline, decline towards more appreciation of values that relate to prosperity, i.e. modern values. It seems to imply that the existence of modern values leads to a modern economy. But I would like to refer to my own experience in terms of the poor countries and the 
the, the systems that, that relate to them, where modern values do exist. I notice individualism, vitalism, and self-expression among the most important properties of the poor. But that yet, they do not derive into modern economies. Uh, no capacity and scope for innovation, no abundance of jobs, no material rewards, no power to earn. Therefore, I may conclude that while modern values are a, necessity, are a necessary condition, they are not sufficient for prosperity. And I really would like to hear a little bit more about that. It seems like in this world, nothing is sufficient. Everything is at best necessary. I mean, I started the book saying, you know, freedom is maybe necessary, but it's not sufficient. You have to have the values. And now some of you are saying the values are not sufficient either. <laughs> we have a long road ahead of us. <laughs> 